Well, thanks everyone for coming. We're going to get started. Uh, we are going to spend the next uh, 45 or 50 minutes talking about taking Texas Monthly Digital. Um, I'll let these guys introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Ryan Krauskup. I'm one of the principals at Intermedia. I'm Chris Kendall. I'm also a principal. I'm lead developer, development manager. Uh, Ethan Worrell, um, also a principal and product owner. Uh, my name is Sam Martin. I'm the director of digital strategy at Texas Monthly. Is everyone hearing us okay? Sound all right? Okay. A little quiet over there. We'll work on that. <laughs> So, so really, I think, you know, I'm not sure how many Texans are in this audience versus folks from out of town, but, uh, you know, most of you probably have seen or heard of Texas Monthly, a uh, very iconic magazine. Uh, I think one of the things that I always notice, you know, if I travel to San Francisco or New York or places and run into other Texans, they typically have the Texas Monthly issue on their coffee table, which I think says a lot about the brand. Um, so over 500,000 distribution. Uh, and they just celebrated their 40th anniversary. So a big part of the reboot, if you will, to a much uh, you know, more modern and usable digital presence, they wanted to coincide with that 40th anniversary, um, which also meant a very hard deadline, which we'll certainly talk about a little bit. Um, the pro project in general started late in 2011 with some concepting, uh, early information architecture work, Basically, what's this thing going to be? How are we going to be successful? How is it going to meet all the needs of the stakeholders and obviously shine uh, in terms of their users and subscribers? Uh, in the spring and summer of 2012, uh, we started to move lightly into development, which mostly consisted of the migration and migration strategy as the design team um, was really starting to ramp up and bringing a lot of the concepting and the IA stuff uh, into actual uh, you know, pretty pictures and pixels. Uh, from there, sort of late summer and then fall and uh, through the end of 2012 was hardcore development and theming uh, and the go live did coincide with the 40th anniversary uh, in February of 2013. So that's just sort of a brief overview. Um, in terms of how we want to structure the panel, we've got about seven or eight topics that we're going to focus on. We very much want to make this interactive. Uh, food coma is probably starting to set in, we're toward the end of the camp. Uh, so I'm probably going to cover or introduce a couple topics, let these guys talk a little bit, and then sort of do Q&A throughout the presentation. So I'd encourage you guys, if you have questions, uh, just raise your hand. I'll come find you and uh, we'll take that question and let these guys respond. Um, I think the first topic we want to talk about is a multi-stakeholder project. And really what that means for Texas Monthly was the Intermedia team as one partner, uh, development and a lot of strategy and information architecture and some wireframing. We worked with FBA, which is Foxtrot Bravo Alpha. They're a uh, design team here in Austin. Um, it's uh, former Milkshake Media guys that uh, broke away and, and have a pretty nice design firm here in town. Uh, and then you can imagine all the internal folks at Texas Monthly, right? Sam runs digital strategy, and he is beholden to ad sales and marketing and creative and audience development. And, and, and I'm sure he can give you a better picture of that. So I, I think we want to start there. and. Uh, I think it'd be interesting, Sam, if you kind of kicked off and, and maybe expand a little bit on, on some of the groups that were involved and you know, some of the stuff that we probably didn't even see as a vendor partner that, that you had to deal with on a daily basis, keeping everyone happy. Right. So um, I came to Texas Monthly uh, actually in April of last year. So I wouldn't call it in the middle of the stream, but a lot of work had already been done. And um, it was the case that a lot had to be undone. Uh, because there was uh, just a lot of miss, um, there wasn't very great focus or the focus wasn't in the right place. Um, and so uh, and my background is I came from Frog Design where I, um, I was uh, the director of content strategy for about five years uh, previous to this. So uh, when I arrived, there were indeed, it, the, the lay of the land was, was that there were quite a few stakeholders and um, in publishing, you know, typically that means editorial and then the business side. But on the business side, there are there are several very important and distinct groups. One is audience development, which takes care of uh, subscriptions um, and literally the building of audience. Um, they um, online are responsible for third-party um, subscription um, uh, um, functionality. And then there's marketing, which is really serves more of a creative services function for advertisers. And then there's the sales team itself. 
So, uh, and then editorial uh, obviously had some very, very distinct needs. So my job was to sort of get, get internally get everybody on the same page, or at least everybody uh, to understand what everybody needed, and then sort of convey that to the design team and then work with these guys at Intermedia to get everything going. And um, it, was, uh, it, it, was, it was very challenging, but um, you know, it was, that's, that's part of the job right there. Uh, a, a very important part of the job is just, just to um, open communication, right? I mean, both internally and externally. And what was key is to have one point person, I think, on a, on a, on a redesign um, and a redevelopment of a site this size. And I'm talking about um, you know, 40 years worth of content it's not all there, but that we had, we had, what do we have, 27 databases or something like that? There were a lot of databases. <laughs> <laughs> so it was very important to have a, a point of, uh, a point of we contact. Closer to 40 databases. Closer to 40. we were done. Yeah. Chris would know. <laughs> um, so getting everybody together and, um, and, and making sure that you had just one, one person to funnel all that through, uh, both internally and externally, was, was really key to the job for sure. You know, the majority of the, uh, when he talks about a single point of contact from a development side, that was where I was, you know, consistently working with SAN, uh, you know, asking our questions, working through a lot of budget and rebudgeting and, you know, using the, the agile uh, methodology to really try to prioritize and focus the work. And, uh, you know, um, at the end of the day, the project, the original scope, you know, was cut by at least 50%, I would say, um, but we were able to deliver a very complete project, um, you know, with a company like Texas Monthly, it, it needs to look very perfect, and so, you know, I think through that communication, we put the focus in the right place and, uh, and met our deadline, and, and in terms of to the public, it was a big step forward, and, you know, to for the business side and the editorial side at Texas Monthly. Um, even though we did have to make some sacrifices, we were able to, to keep the focus in the right place and, and, and hit the deadline. Yeah, and, and I think that's a good segue. You know, one of, the, one of the challenges that we saw consistently was that, and I've got this slide up right now, pixel perfection. I think a lot of us are used to projects where the minimum viable product, minimum viable product can be feature complete but there's still some spit and polish that can happen because you're working with a startup that needs to have a product live or you're working with a company that maybe isn't as brand conscious as somebody like Texas Monthly where they are you know, incredibly, incredibly uh, concerned with and proud of their font treatments and cover designs and all that stuff. So I'd, I'd like to spend a couple minutes, and I don't know if Ethan or Sam, if one of you guys want to kick it off, but talking a little bit more about the partnership between FBA uh, and Texas Monthly and Intermedia because I, I felt like the the working relationship there was really really critical to the project maybe even more so sometimes than some of the internal stakeholders because really that was that was where the rubber was meeting the road. Yeah, yeah uh, <clears throat> well I won't get into that, but <laughs> 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 well, I, well, what we're what we're laughing about up here is that uh, we had done all this work and we were like uh, you know. It, it, we launched the website, and then about two weeks later, we got like basically a cease and desist letter from uh, Heffler uh, because we were essentially we had we were not licensed to use the fonts that we were using. So uh, after all uh, of the of the work, they basically said, "You guys are using these fonts illegally. You have to take them down immediately." And we were like, "Well, let's just set up a, a, an account, you know." And they're like, "Sorry, you have to take the web fonts down." Uh, then s before we before we move forward with anything, so we had to take the web fonts down. We had to find some similar looking fonts, and and so it just goes to show you. I mean, like that, that it's it's an ongoing process. And you know, just speaking of this perfection idea, I mean, the site is still we're still rolling out features, and 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 I'm not quite sure that that will necessarily ever be finished. I mean, I think we're getting really really close. Um, you know, as as Ethan likes to say, and what I say to to everybody at Texas Monthly now, I mean, we're, we're, we're not building web pages anymore. We're in the software business. And for a magazine like Texas Monthly, uh, that's, that's a little bit of a, uh, that's a difficult thing to understand. I mean, people have done things in a certain way for a very long time. And, um, and, 
and that doesn't necessarily convey to to the website but so going back to the perfection thing, I mean, yeah, you know, it's if you're if you're in the magazine business, if you're if you're publishing, um, you want things to look perfect, you, you know, and um, and uh, and that's the mentality, and that's what that was just the standard that that these guys had to meet, and there was a lot of back and forth, and it, it got it got really hairy at times. And and I think the important thing in in general is to acknowledge that when you're prioritizing your backlog is to say, you know, is this a client where we can sacrifice, you know, some of the pixel perfection for functionality and they can live with that. And, and what's more important is that we, you know, are able to have this complete set of, you know, this application that absolutely has to work all the way through, or, you know, can you cut large pieces of functionality that people won't miss them if they aren't there and then when, when they come out it's you know it's a press release or an announcement or, or whatnot um, and but you know make sure that the site really looks perfect and, and so I, I think that's just an important distinction that we have to make in our our line of work when you know you start trying to fit all of this work into a budget that might not you know have enough room in it for everything so yeah. Sam mentioned the uh Harry back and forth on design. I think midway through we we recognized a way to, to kind of cut that off of the past and things got a lot smoother when we we started working a little more closely with the design guys at FBA and at first you know we they were seeing designs and they were working through iterations of designs before we saw it and uh, by the time we saw it it's like yeah that's not Drupal friendly we can probably make that work but that's that's six weeks of work just for that uh, whereas once we started working with them and they were showing us the designs before, we were able to have our input on that and work towards a lot more Drupal-friendly solutions that met essentially the same design solutions. And then once the guys at Texas Monthly saw it, it, it seriously cut down on those iterations. And just a, a just quick note on budgets, too. Um, there was, the and, and it relates to what Chris said, uh, there was always um, for the first, I don't know, all through last summer, you know, we would come up with these wonderful designs, and and then I would say, you know, Ethan, Chris, can we do this? They're like, you guys, you guys can do anything, absolutely. Um, and you know, at some point, I said, you have to stop telling me that. You have to say, no, you cannot do that, <laughs> because it's going to cost too much money. We can do it. <laughs> yes, yeah. you can. Right. I mean, like, so uh, what I've learned about developers is that yes, and and about development is that yes, everything is in fact possible, but. Put a budget to it, and that changes the equation. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was interesting because we we were basically seeing design before the client, and asking them to change the design before Texas Monthly got excited about things that would cost a lot of money. You know, it's it's like you don't you know give your kid a gift for Christmas and then go ah actually let me give you this different gift that's you know gonna fit into the family budget a little bit better. <laughs> so by, by kind of having that buffer, um, things started smoothing out quite a bit. Cool. We're going to move into some a little bit more technology focused stuff. Before we do that, does anyone have questions on kind of multi-stakeholder or any sort of general questions? Nobody? All right, I'm going to give you one factoid then, which is I think is pretty cool. And it uh, doesn't have a whole lot to do with the website. But if anyone has seen the barbecue issue, always a big, you know, every four or five years, you know, it's the big, huge barbecue issue. Go back and look at the cover. All of the fonts done is all done in barbecue sauce. So the, the head creative director, the executive creative director at Texas Monthly actually used and tested a variety of different barbecue sauces and did every bit of written word on that cover in barbecue sauce. And then they photographed it and, you know, did whatever graphic magic goes on. But anyway, cool little factoid. Um, so for the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes, we're probably going to talk mostly about migration, panels, module customization. Um, we've touched on the migration a little bit in terms of you know, 40 disparate databases and a bunch of technical debt. Um, but I think, Chris, if you want to kind of kick off the discussion um, you know, and sort of walk through what the intermediate process was from you know, due diligence and kind of the early, oh my god, how are we going to wade through all this stuff, to you know, kind of the ending where we had a a comprehensive and, and you know fairly sensible strategy to start mapping up that migration into into a Drupal friendly world. Well, as we already mentioned, um, there what we were told was we have a custom CMS 
and uh, we're going to want to migrate that over to the Drupal. And once we dug in there, we we found out it was it wasn't that simple. They had uh, all different formats of, of websites. They had different sitelets that I think, uh, in some cases, we would stumble across them by wandering through through due diligence, wandering through the uh, servers themselves, and just literally finding sites that were sitting out there, looking through Apache and finding them. And we'd ask them, and, and in some cases, they were like, oh, yeah, that, that can go away. And in other cases, we, we got to, oh, yeah, um, let's work that into the scope, too. And, uh, and you know, that, that's when I stepped back, and they, they worked things out, and we reordered things. Um, it, the different formats we found in there was, was the, the custom CMS that was built. And, you know, we going through that and going through the code, trying to find where things are and, and what data was related to that uh, site, we found several developers' practices through there through the days. Mm -hmm. you, you could some were well commented, and then things were great, and we could find it. And others, you know, there wasn't a comment. We were on our own trying to find those things. There were some WordPress sites, um, and then there were just plain old HTML and PHP files sitting out there that were that were being served. So it was through due diligence we found out a little bit, but really wandering day to day through their file system, through their data, finding where things were was how we ended up at the end of the project, figuring out what we needed to migrate and where we needed to migrate it to. Um, one of the bigger challenges, other than finding where they put all the images related to all these uh, different sites and sitelets and PHP files, some were, some were, had naming conventions that made sense, some had no naming conventions, some were in good directory structures, some were over on another file system somewhere. Uh, the biggest challenge was, uh, while we're doing, while they're working on designs and uh, and everything, we're doing all this due diligence to figure out how we're going to migrate it. But we're also starting our development process on the the harder parts. Uh, we'll get into some of those later. But things like uh, issue promotion, story promotion to different channels on the website, things like that. So we needed to, before we could migrate, we needed to first know where, what we were migrating, and we also needed to know where we were going to migrate that to and how we were going to migrate it where, you know, how those content types were going to be set up, what was just going to be an entity, what was going to be a node, what was going to be terms, what, you know, all of this was up in the air, so the migration part really couldn't happen until we had that, and we didn't have everything we needed to know yet to know where that was going to go. So the, uh, the migration module was a godsend for that. Uh, I don't know if you've ever used it, but it's, in D7, it's really come a long way, and it, it makes life pretty easy. While it does make life pretty easy, it also made life pretty hard when you've got some developers working on something and, you know, one developer might communicate to the other that's doing the migration, okay, this is how this content type is going to be. So for all, for instance, all these blogs that are coming in, we know how it's going to be, but for this other stuff, it might change after we've already decided, you know, this is how it's going to be. Now somebody kind of threw a wrench at us and we got to change it. For migration, you kind of got to wipe that, that data. You can't just reorganize it. Um, doing that in, a, in an environment where you're quickly staging and trying to get things ready to go live really isn't feasible because it bogs down a server when you're doing node deletes and, and node saves just over and over in, with an automated process like that. So we had to quickly come up with ways to uh, have multiple staging instances, quickly deciding, you know, keeping track of which ones using which data and at what state that migration process and that deletion process was in. So. That was definitely one of the biggest hurdles, was getting the job done in time with migration happening at the exact same time as you're, you're building it. Yeah, and, and Sam, I'm interested if you want to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the importance of the archives. I mean, that's one thing that, that we didn't really touch on, but, you know, Texas Monthly, we've talked about a 40-year anniversary, and um, I don't remember exactly where we landed, but we migrated a ton of old archived issues, and, yeah. and I think a lot of that was the importance, you know, some of the history, uh, the data certainly, but the the idea of you know bringing forth this very very rich content set and, and making it accessible. Yeah, well, uh, we don't have the entire um, archives um, digitized, uh, but we have a lot of it. <clears throat> the, the the thing that I find that was very challenging for me in my position was, uh, you know, migration is an entirely alien concept to. Um, to, to it was to the people at Text Monthly, right? So, 
I had to go and say like they're having trouble migrate not having trouble but there's just a lot to migrate and it's all as Chris was saying in these different formats and um, and um, and you know um, it was it was just a struggle for me to have to explain this to you know the president who had been at the magazine for 35 years to the editor who had never done uh, never done a website before and so uh, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's just important as, as developers to know when you're working with clients that um, it, you know you, you're oftentimes dealing with people who just don't understand who just don't have the same understanding of the way Drupal works of the way like you can say there's a there's a migration module but um, you know what the heck does that mean to somebody to the editor of text monthly it doesn't really mean anything he's just he just wants to get the content on the site so um, just something to consider when you're working with with clients and your um, I think just really across the board you know you just have to sort of there's a certain amount of patience these guys were great by the way at, at that patience and, and 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 it's still it's an ongoing educational uh, process right it's not just development like we're, we're literally educating people and, that, that's uh, what we mean when we when we use the term technical debt uh, yeah. by having the different developers and not having a, a process for them to make sure they commented by not making sure they had you know documentation on where these files are stored for which site they've, mm -hmm. they've built themselves a bit of technical debt and you know a couple of things to consider when doing a, a large-scale migration like this in terms of um, you know, some challenges we ran into is, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, the formatting, bringing it in and, and keeping the HTML intact. But, um, like, for instance, we had authors on different sites. They actually had a Drupal 6 site for a site called TM Daily Post that went away when the new site went live. They had several WordPress blogs, and then they had their custom uh, CMS. So um, when we did the migration, we would actually pull in the author reference, and we were turning authors are, are basically just a taxonomy uh, in the new site because it's it's really not like users create their profiles it's much more like they publish it and they reference which authors are multiple authors and those term pages become profiles for their bio and and all the stories they've written um, so we would have uh, we had um, a ton of duplicates because we would have authors on different sites and we couldn't necessarily um, merge them all on the migration. Uh, but that's where Drupal is really great because we were able to use you know, just a simple VBO to do a lot of that consolidation after the import was complete. Um, similarly on the dining guide we had a lot of uh, different pricing um, tags that they were using so on the import you know, we, they, they really wanted to show I think it's like seven or eight different price ranges for a restaurant. Um, and use that in the, the dining guide search results. And um, we were able to just use, once again, use a VBO to consolidate those to, you know, that simple list from a list of like, you know, like 200 different pricing kind of nomenclatures that have been used over the course of, you know, years and years at Texas Monthly and the old CMS. So, you know, there, there are things that uh, I think, and, you know, and that's something, I'm not a developer. I'm, I'm but I'm pretty hands-on with Drupal, and I have a background as an engineer. And you know, there's a lot of things you can do as a product owner to help smooth out these types of issues and take some of the load off of your development team. Um, if if you really kind of tap into the uh, you know the Drupal administration, and you know we created quick views for searching for which uh, stories had the hero image with the right you know, format in terms of, you know, the new site used like a nice wide image, whereas the old site had a lot of images that were like thin vertical. So we use that to be able to go through and quickly hide those images where they just didn't really work in the new layout. So, you know, that, that's, that's some of the triage that was going on as well. He mentioned VBO, that's uh, for anybody that doesn't know, it's views bulk operations. It's any developers out there, I mean, the first, first inclination you have when somebody says we got to clean up this data is like okay I'm gonna write a I'm gonna write a query to parse through this and find the things and fix it and reorganize the data but if you've got good site builders on your team and guys that are familiar with it I mean they don't have to know the data structure View, views bulk operations is a developer's best friend in that case because you just set them up with it and they, they go to town 
otherwise you're going to be doing that the data manipulations over and over each time and, and they can run it and do it as many times as they want without having to come back to you cool all right I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, <clears throat> this is one of the topics uh, that we have that is it really sort of straddles development uh, and kind of old school Texas monthly business needs I mean they're a magazine so you've heard Sam talk about the editorial team uh, no magazines without the editors, right? And so there's a very, very um, historical and refined editorial process that uh, a writer on through the entire process to final edits and then, okay, we're gonna print this thing in the upcoming magazine. Uh, that still exists, right? Texas Monthly is churning out an issue every month. Well, with the introduction of a much more modern and flexible website, the idea is we want to be able to publish web content every day, multiple times a day perhaps, whether it's blogs, whether it's you know, covering some sort of breaking news item, uh, all sorts of permutations of how that might happen. And I think maybe Sam, if you want to kick off a little bit and kind of give an idea of how that editorial process works at a high level and what some of the challenges are, and then maybe we can move over to, to you know, Ethan and Chris and talk a little bit about how we had to kind of fit into that, you know, refined and very much adopted editorial process within Texas Monthly and do something that would work to allow both of those things to happen and, and play nice? Well, I will say that um, the process by which we publish web-only stories is is still evolving. Um, you know, the traditional way you publish a story is, you know, there is an editor, they assign the story, the writer goes out, writes the story, turns in a draft, there's two or three rewrites, and then there's a copy edit, and then there's a proofread, and then you publish. Well, that just doesn't work these days, right? Um, having said that, we have it's, we can do that. We can do that with the site that we have right now. Um, that's why I say that how we're publishing is in flux. I mean, um, you know, uh, we could very easily get into a discussion of you know how digital media in general is evolving right now, but I don't think that's where we want to go with this. But um, it's really all about speed. I mean, the blogs are ending up to be kind of our best friends these days because they really do allow for very, very fast publishing. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but the requirements were there and, and are necessary. We, we, we needed to have, um, you know, we have a lot of interns, so we needed to have sort of a, a, a permission for someone that was just doing data entry that could not publish and that they would put into you know, sort of a cue for um, for the editor to look at and um, and make sure that uh, all the T's are crossed, and then publish. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that's all. I mean, so and you know, the thing. Um, yeah, no, that's all there. And we're using Workbench with you know revisions. So it's, it's, it's pretty. First standard. thing, the first thing anybody that's worked with Drupal is going to say is it's handled. Right. And that's a good thing about Drupal, you know, using the workbench with roles mm -hmm. and uh, revisions, you'd think would handle it perfectly, but, you know, as always, that's the thing you say in the first meeting, but then when you dig in, you discover, well, I shouldn't have spoken so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, but, yeah, it, it, it essentially did come down to workbench with revisions and roles. Um, yeah. David Fells, one of our developers, uh, ended up with a contributed module based off of this because as you work the way it works, say one author authors it, the next person, the editor might come through and uh, make the changes that it becomes theirs now. Uh, so he wrote a quick, pretty simple little module that I think is going to be useful to people. It's called revision ownership. Essentially, you can govern who owns that yourself. You don't have to take it over if you're the one that edits it. So the original author remains the author and can, once he's done with it, he can go back and edit it himself. So really came in handy. Yeah. There are, f there are f uh, features on the site. Um, for example, we have what we call a feature board. I know we're going to get into that later. We also have <coughs> slideshows for each channel. And one, one of the very handy things that we can do is, is essentially, um, you know, rather than having to go into a, um, they, they're their own content type. And that is, has ended up being very um, a very fast process for us. Yeah, please. Okay, so the, the, the question was, uh, he's asking if there was anything specifically that we ran into in Workbench that 
caused problems or made things challenging? Yeah, kind of keeping this to it's non-technical, keep it kind of along the, the 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 track we're on. I can I can say we you know revisions makes uh, makes for a huge database. So uh, I can tell you one of the the biggest problems as developers working on this is once we throw once you throw workbench and revisions in there, your syncing is it's not a oh let me sync up real quick you know do my drush SQL sync. Um, it essentially becomes I'm gonna go to bed now and I probably won't be done until sometime tomorrow. So you want to kick that off late at night and uh, we're actually working on something now that's going it, to, it's going to give a timeline to those revisions. So it, you know, if, if, if something's had revisions and it's, and it's out there, we're not going to need to go back to it after it's been there for six months. So we're working on a way to kind of revision clean up. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, uh, what are some of the best techniques, and, and maybe specific to Texas Monthly, what are some of the tactics that they're using to drive traffic for a, for a, traf uh, for a content-heavy site? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it all starts with content. Um, so uh, tr audience will come if there's something to read. So, so um, you know, publishing every day, I think, is the most important thing that we can do to get audience to the site. Um, one of the things that we didn't launch with, but that we just recently did, I think, was was really key, and that was to um, we put in pa we paginated our stories, <coughs> and then we also added in like related stories, more Texas Monthly, and then most popular. And what we've seen actually is the the time spent on the site has increased by literally a minute, and the page, the number of pages per visit have increased uh, by by an entire page. So. Uh, what we're seeing is those hooks are bringing people back into the site uh, and they're staying longer and hopefully sharing more. Uh, I mean, it, it's a, you know, it's a social web right now and so the content that we publish must also be like shareable social content. Um, it really does come back to content. I mean, we have other hooks, you know, um, and, and other things that we offer, um, newsletters. Uh, we have a, a really robust newsletter database and we're offering more of those. Um, and, uh, and, and we're still trying to figure out, quite frankly, uh, better ways of getting, of getting more traffic. But it does start with content and ends with content. Okay. Let's maybe go to the next slide. Panels, best friend of developers and admins. Uh, very, very heavy use of panels in the site. Um, I think Chris, you know, we're probably starting to run a little close on time, so okay. I'd say, you know, give a quick synopsis and some of the. Yeah, I, I can say that uh, once once we got into panels, our, our company, I don't think there's, I don't think we can, as developers, find any other solution that would even come close, hold a candle to, to using panels, especially we d we develop using um, Compass and SAS for the CSS and. Uh, for developer workflow, for multiple developers working on the same stuff, there's there's no comparison to that. And with panels, that this just se a seamless integration there. We use um, custom layouts. And um, again, I'm trying not to get this too technical. If if you have questions, feel free to email me or, or talk to me after the session about how we do it. Um, we do custom layouts. I'm sure if you've used it before, you've seen how heavy the output, the default output by panels is. And it, while very useful and and very uh, controllable by CSS. You know, you may you may not need everything that puts in there. So do some custom layouts, and you know, kind of follow your own practice on what how you know you're going to need to theme it and style it. And and it's just so simple using that way. The other thing that uh, panels really brings is the ability to use the C tools content types. Um, that is. Uh, for a developer, if you've used blocks, written out your custom blocks, uh, you'll know that context just really isn't there. You have to kind of sniff the page. You have to figure out where you are. You might have to load your nodes all in your block custom code. That's built in with the uh, custom panes, uh, C tools content types. It's just essentially blocks on steroids that are context aware and available to the site builders to just who understand how the panels works. They can rearrange these panels. They can add these panes to whatever panels they want. For instance, the sidebars, they might, we might have built a, a custom pane widget for most popular, and it just knows which 
uh, it's context aware of what story you're on and it's just going to go pull that for them and developers don't have to touch it. Um, and again, it, it comes down to also having a good team where you've got, you've got uh, site builders and admins who, who aren't afraid to kind of come to you and ask questions on how they can use these panels and, and really dig in and, and make them work for them. Great. So maybe if you want to pull up the, the home page, uh, you know, the next thing we're going to talk about, and this is, uh, you know, right up there with editorial workflow, a, a very, very key part of the Texas monthly business is sort of flexibility around, especially for the web, how they're going to display stories, um, you know, how quickly can we change them out, how quickly can we promote them. Um, so we did quite a bit of module customization that, that sort of focused on creating all these unique uh, channels, stories, tiles, and the ability to promote and move those around. And, and maybe, Sam, if you want to talk more eloquently than I am about why that's such a business need for Texas Monthly, uh, and then you know our guys can talk a little bit about what we did to make that happen. Well, Texas Monthly has always been a, a, a very, um, we've been very proud of our photography, and we've always had, um, <coughs> we've, um, and, and continue to have very strong visuals in the magazine, and we, we definitely wanted to bring that uh, to the site and make that something that um, that sort of you were you were impacted with right when you got there. So, um, in partnership with the uh, with the designers, we came up with this idea of a feature board, which is what you see here, uh, to where you know the, the top stories of the day uh, you would you would see them in visual form. And that you know, and when you mouse over, then you would get more information, uh, and then you could click through to the story. Um, and we really tried to, uh, you know, so the idea of the feature board. It, it, by the way, it can be either a multi-pane feature board or it can be a single large image. And we use that single large image for, um, you know, things uh, for important breaking news. Um, when Willie does something. <laughs> yeah, basically when Willie Nelson uh, does anything, but um, uh, during development it was like the the, the you know, we like well when Willie dies we're gonna want to have a big thing there and so yeah everyone was like don't say that, um, but um, so it, it really does allow for sort of an impactful first impression, uh, and we tried to we tried to carry that through uh, the entire site, even on the story pages. Ethan earlier mentioned we've got these nice wide images, and on the channel pages, uh, we don't duplicate the feature board that is unique to the home page, um, but uh, we do have uh, large sort of slideshows uh, on on each channel page. Those, those feature boards were, and, and that's the one thing about going to the meetings with these guys when the, hearing them brainstorm with the designers and just sitting over there as the developer that, you know, sees the, sees the, the deadline and, and, and hears them talking about all these really cool things and, and just knowing that it's really cool stuff to build and really fun to build, but man. Where's that deadline? It's not moving out any. <laughs> and then, but that's where it was good to, you know, at first it's like, yeah, that's really cool. I think we can do that. And then it kind of became more complex and more complex. And then being able to sit there in the room with them and the designers and kind of talk it down to a more Drupal friendly way, it, it ended up, you know, while it was a big task, it was a fun task to do. And it, it we were able to build it, you know, the first time through the way we wanted it. And it, it worked out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, I think that's a good segue. We've got about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure there's time for more questions. That The last topic we're going to hit on is uh, <laughs> a little bit tongue-in-cheek. You know, initially we had this title, and you guys might have seen it on the, uh, the initial write-up. was like, you know, can't we have it all? You know, sort of good luck with that. And we felt like that was maybe a little, you know, a little more pessimistic than the actual situation. But uh, the spirit of it is the same and very similar to how we started off talking about the multi-stakeholder. It's really how can we keep everyone happy knowing that, there is a hard launch. I mean, it was, uh, you know, Jake Silverstein, the editor, uh, announced, you know, kind of, we were still, uh, you know, is it going to be a Monday? Is it going to be a Wednesday? And in his, in his daily or weekly blog, you know, okay, well, the new website's going to be live on such and such a date. And it's like, okay, I guess it's going to be Monday. Um, but, you know, it's an it's a issue whether you're on the client side, whether you're a business owner, whether you're a developer, everybody comes up against with scope, deadline, budget. Right? And, and you can't have it all unless you're, you know, everything is flexible, which is hardly ever the case in the real world. So 
Um, maybe just in summary, you guys can chat a little bit about sort of what that meant, you know, kind of individually, or you know, maybe you know, however, however you want to approach that topic. But the idea of triangulating between those three very sometimes painful topics. Um, so we provided an estimate for this project. Uh, you know, we first started in in March of 2012, and um, very early on, you know, Texas Monthly's fiscal year begins on March 1st, and so by the time we were there in March, they had already submitted their budget. And so um, we basically throughout the engagement, we would look at the scope and there, you know, it was kind of like we were at a 30,000 foot view in April and then maybe by, you know, August, we were getting a little bit closer to the ground and, and so Sam and, and his team would say, okay, well, now that you know more, what do you think this is gonna cost? And, you know, there's still, you know, I think the final set of design files were delivered on December 12th and, you know, the site went live on February 1st. So clearly even in August, we were still, see, you know, the majority of the design was delivered between September 15th and, and you know, the end of November. And uh, you know, so what we started doing is we would just put it in a Google Docs spreadsheet and we would, you know, do, you know, one line, you know, one row per item. And if we had, and we'd put like a best and worst case, we would do a little summary of it. And so it was like super simple where we might, you know, for an item that we didn't know a lot about, but we could see that there was a lot of complexity, we might say, you know, we kind of use the, um, what is it, the story points, I forget the mathematical reference to that, but you know, it's like one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 20, 40. I call it 100. a dartboard. Uh. Yeah, so we, we <laughs> might say, you know, 40 to 100 on one item. We might say 13 to 20. And, and He's talking we're about just, hours. Yeah, about, about hours, but, but we were just, you know, kind of generally, and then it would add up, and we would throw up, you know, a percentage uh, multiplier for things like QA deployment, project management, things of that nature and, and just kind of factor out the price at the bottom and and pretty much throughout the process that number was always quite a bit higher than you know what the parent company of Texas Monthly wanted it to be and the, the higher ups that, that they had budgeted for but you know it it served as a, a strong communication tool for us to make decisions and prioritize it without spending too much time on it at the same time and what we ended up doing was literally making a priority list, you know, so when, when things started getting closer to the deadline and the budget started getting tighter, then we could, you know, my team, uh, we would take that Google Doc and we would say, okay, do we really need this for launch? Uh, do we, or can we push it out to Q1 of the next fiscal? fiscal? And, and so we went down the list and, and, and it, was, it was really clear, you know, that like, you know, when you start getting like 15 or 16 on the list, those things are probably not going to make it uh, at launch. And, and indeed, quite a few things didn't make it on launch. But so the question that I was uh, that I was having with my team and the realities that we were facing was was that we're not going to launch with the completed site. We're not going to launch with the with the with the entire site. But that's okay. As uh, and we were making decisions. Basically, we don't want to launch with something that's going to look like crap. And, and damage the brand. So let's e either we're going to do it right or we're not going to do it. You know. So uh, and a lot of those things we didn't do. And uh, I made reference earlier. We're still rolling out features now, and uh, and the process that we're working now I think is working really well. And that is what Ethan was talking about. That's say you know okay we want to do a new channel for example. Um, how much is it? You know can you do that estimate for us? And what are the different items that are going to need to be developed in order to make that a reality? And um, and then I take that and consider it. And sometimes I say, okay, we, let's do one through five, but let's not do six and seven. And they and they say, great. And and then they do a sprint. And uh, it's it's working out really well. But it was a painful process in the beginning because um, uh, yeah, we, it was like kids in a candy store, you know, for for most of the people at Texas Monthly, they were like, because we were seeing designs and we were like, that looks great, let's do that. And um, and then, you know, it was the classic 
um, architect uh, builder analogy. You know, our architect was telling us we could have all these fancy things, and our builder was telling us you can't do that. It's going to cost too much money. Or actually, they were saying you can do that. It's just going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> right. I think the 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 hardest when it comes down to you know can they have it all it 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 came down to on the development side to we, there really was no wiggle room and, and it goes back to that pixel perfection we they wanted it to look like those designs and and those designers were they they designed what these guys in print wanted to see and that that was probably the the biggest challenge was getting you know through the when you're dealing with this client where you, a functional wireframe functional isn't what they care about really yeah they they assumed we were going to get it to work but you couldn't just present them with okay look at this and make sure this is how you're going to want it to work really you had to already have it themed out and looking exactly like they wanted it for them to look at it or else those were the only comments you got back but you're like but did it work right <laughs> yeah but at, at, at the end you know i you know maybe not for you but for me it was worth it to the, see the smile on whether it was jake the editor's face or tj the creative director you know when we rolled this thing out the, the appreciation and yes, we pulled it off reaction from the Texas Monthly team. I, you know, did, did it put to bed you know, all of the late nights and, and the complexity and the back and forth and the challenge? Maybe not entirely, but it, it feels good to see that appreciation from the client. And I think that's, you know, for me anyway, it has turned our relationship with Texas Monthly into a partnership as much as uh, client vendor relationship and, and I think that's something that's pretty special when you're in professional services and, and I will say just to just to end really quickly that I mean w we have successfully transformed uh, the digital landscape at Texas Monthly you know uh, the you know and I'm told this by not only the president of Texas Monthly but by the the president of MS communications that owns Texas Monthly that uh, this is this was the most important initiative that the magazine has done in at least a decade, and, and it is the future of Texas Monthly. So, you know, there's a lot writing on this, and there still is, and we have by no means figured it out, but, but we feel very strongly that we've got the right tool to do it, uh, and I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, so we're, we're just a couple minutes away, so I'm gonna move to some questions and, and hopefully take them pretty quickly. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, uh, you know, he's hearing from the panel that in general, a staged rollout was was acceptable to the client, and uh, I guess kind of what you're looking for is, is some of the backstory to that, and then how how acceptable was that really? And and, and I can actually, I was, you know, in those meetings, and um, it was very it was very difficult. You know, it uh, there were some very very productive meetings. You know, Sam was talking about using the prioritization process. There were some very very amicable, yes, we can cut this. Uh, there was another meeting where the president of Emmis, I mean, you know, Sam's bosses, bosses, you know, but maybe we'll have to kill the entire project. And, you know, you've got a room full of 15 people, all just go ghostly white. And was that ever really a true risk? Probably not, but I was, uh, I was highly uncomfortable in my chair at that point, that's for sure. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, please. Sure. Yeah, so the question is, and I'll shorten it a little bit, is just kind of how, what was the process that we worked under and how did we win the business? Um, I can take the first part of the question because I, I'm primarily responsible for a lot of our business development. Um, one of the principals at FBA, the design firm, actually posted a comment out into the Drupal, Drupal community and said, hey, we're, we're looking for some Drupal help on a, a large you know, magazine project. And, we knew the FBA guys from before. We worked on them, you know, worked with another project. And so I called them. I was like, I was like, hey, why, why didn't you just call me? Of course, you know, we'd love to work on this. And instead, you're putting it out into the whole Drupal community. And uh, so we really did have it. Um, you know, the introduction to Texas Monthly was very, very warm, if you will, from a sales standpoint, um, via a design firm that we had a past relationship with. Um, I would call the process from there, at least from a sales standpoint, pretty typical. We talked about budget. We talked about 
you know, we have a fairly formal discovery process that we go through for a project of that size. Uh, so lots of Q&A, lots of trying to, you know, uncover all the, you know, the, the nasty little details, if you will, and you, you never get them all. But so we went through that process, provided a very ballpark estimate. But to Ethan's point earlier, that happened in, you know, March of 2012. And really what we were saying is, hey, we think this is about what it ought to take to build a, uh, you know, big publishing work, work, uh, work website. Um, lots of stuff were uncovered, and I think we've, we've talked in a lot of detail about some of those things that were uncovered. I think the, the most important thing from the development side was kind of digging in and doing the proof of concepts, because they're asking us for, uh, for estimates on things that they hadn't really even scoped out. Um, so in order to get that, you kind of got to do the due diligence, and you kind of got to do some proof of concepts to say, yeah, that's, that's going to be possible. I can't tell you it's going to be this many hours right now, but I can tell you we have a good idea on how we're going to do it. And it was, it was basically a handshake deal when, when it came down to yeah. you know, getting the project. As we said, we're committed to making this work. And, and I think that you know, we didn't have to go in with a fixed bid or any sort of strong language. They understood that they were still defining the project, that their budget was likely unrealistic. And, um, but you know, I, th I, th I think they did talk to a handful of firms, and um, but it, it really was just posted out on into the Drupal community, and we happened to have a relationship with the design firm, which was helpful. Yeah. And the recommendation from the design firm meant a lot to us um, <coughs> because we have worked with them in the past, and one of the principals at FBA used to work at Texas Monthly. So, yeah, uh, we probably have time for one, maybe two more questions. Yeah, go ahead. K4. Something, right? Yep. So yeah, you have this thing of like, do you have, how do you manage this thing of the truth of what, what's the true version of, of the, the source of the content? Right? Um, so, so, so that well, was me, cut from the project. <laughs> 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 so, so, the, so the question was, how did we, um, you know, sort of get the editorial workflow from, to, yeah. to replicate the internal workflow, right. and this so I mean, I could, so the, yeah, the question was how 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 are they making sure that what's in print is exactly what gets pushed to um, you know the the website and the original scope included a K four integration where we we would do a custom module that mapped to um, you know there were, somebody had developed a custom module to integrate with K four, which is the publishing uh, software that. Texas Monthly uses, but nothing existed for Drupal 7. Uh, we looked at it. It seemed like it was relatively straightforward, but it was just one of the items that you know they could live without uh, for a launch based on you know all the stuff we've been talking about. Yes. Yep. And K4 is our um, is the is the the record. That's where we keep all of the you know. But once it's. Uh, you know, I, I mean, that's one of the, the things about a website is that, you know, you can just put that in the backlog, and when the time comes, we can, we can do that. We've done the due diligence on it, and it's definitely possible. So it's down the pike, I can see it. I'm not sure. Is there a? We're, we're at four o'clock. Is should we cut this, or do we have time for another question? If there are more. Any other? No, we started a little bit late. Are there? If anyone has any? Yeah, any go for it all. I mean, until they kick me out of here, I'll keep talking. Well, that, that is the tablet uh, version. That's uh, our tablet version is a replica of the magazine, and uh, uh, and that's all done through a third party called Pacific Coast Data, sure. PCD. Um, yeah. So. Uh, right. <laughs> yes, it is, um, and. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I know that that's that's we're developing that. What's funny is that, and so that this is the this is the um, this is a whole other stakeholder. You know, it goes back to the first question: the audience development and what they're doing over there 
um, even with you know we have two apps that we're working with, uh, and there are um, you know there, we have Android versions of those, but um, uh, PCD for whatever reason these people are, are you know for whatever reason they they only it will only integrate with with the Apple iTunes Store. So in order to get the bundle, you have to have you have to get it on your iPad. Yeah, please do. I, I think we're uh, I think we're probably out of time at this point. Um, I want to I want to thank our panelists, you know Sam especially for coming out and participating. Um, I think it's nice to see our clients and people that uh, you know within that are very important to the Drupal community to come out and support us. So thank you very much. Thanks,